I'm here re with Rahim Akbar. He's a third generation traditional woodworking artist. Rahim's art showcases the beauty and simplicity of Islamic art. His wood carvings grace ceilings, walls, and doors, and also serve as standalone pieces. One of his works was recently featured at Rung, South Asian Heritage Day at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Rahim, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. Assalamu alaikum. So tell us about uh, your installation at the ROM to begin with. How did you get there? Uh, it was a very interesting process. Uh, I was contacted by the, the Rung lead team and they asked me if I can produce some work for their upcoming show at ROM. Uh, it took me a while to come up with an idea of the installation that I, was wanted, I wanted to do. I wanted to be more relevant, more contemporary, but also showcase the beauty of the Islamic art. Uh, so I designed this uh, tower which was 10 feet tall and it incorporates the uh, various screen designs from Mughal architecture in India and Pakistan. I designed it and uh, we brought it over to Ram and uh, it was uh, alhamdulillah well received and there was very good turnaround, turn up of the people and a lot of people attended the show. Okay, so can you tell us, uh, I guess to take a step back, can you tell us what sort of woodwork you do? What is woodworking to begin with? In the Islamic art, the woodworking holds a very special position. Uh, if, you, uh, if you can imagine yourself uh, being in uh, Middle East uh, 600 years ago, there is no forest over there. So the wood is very sacred and it comes from remote areas. So the only the positions or places of very high uh, valued were decorated in wood. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the wood would be used in members, which is supposed to be a, is a, is a place in a, in a masjid where the Imam climbs up. And so the focal point of the, the mosque. The focal point of the mosque. Other places or the areas of the mosque will be adored in uh, plaster or in the tile work or what have you. So the wood, because it was so uh, scarce, uh, will only be used for uh, focal points like doors, entryways, ceilings, and you see them in uh, Alhambra adorning the ceilings. And uh, that there's, there's a very large, huge tradition of woodwork in mm -hmm. Islam. When did wood come to be used in Islamic art? Uh, as early as uh, uh, wood has been used uh, in the architecture long before the Islam actually came. So w w what Muslims did when they, they, uh, they continued on their tradition of using the wood and art and incor started incorporating it in their mosques. So uh, if you were to go back, the Coptic churches in Middle East, they used beautiful woodwork. And uh, when these communities became Muslim, they, they brought that tradition of woodwork with them and they started using it in the, in the houses of worship in mosques. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, using a material doesn't make it Islamic or un-Islamic. It's just whatever material is available to the community or to the people or uh, that makes it more relevant. Mm -hmm. Now we want to show a time lapse of some of your work. Um, it's a mosque in North Carolina. Perhaps you can lead us through what, what the viewers are seeing now. Uh, it was an interesting project. Uh, me and my friend were traveling to North Carolina. We stopped at a local mosque and uh, we were sitting there and we thought uh, wouldn't it be nice to dress this mihrab up. I designed the mihrab and my friend sponsored it and uh, we went in there. We put the baseboard on the front of the mihrab and then I brought in the carved wooden pieces which were designed and fabricated in my shop in Houston and then we installed it on top of it. It was a process that took us a whole day and in the end we finished it with the top coat, we painted it, put some trim on top and in the end we had a very beautiful looking mihrab at the end of 24 hours. And the interesting thing is the mosque over there did not know that it was coming. So it was a very pleasant surprise for the community in uh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. You've also done some work at the Institute of Knowledge in, in LA. Can you tell us about that as well? Uh, Institute of Knowledge is a brand new facility which is a purpose-built Islamic center built in Diamond Bar, California, which is part of LA. It's a large uh, structure with a very tall dome and it has a very beautiful mihrab. So I was called in to design the mihrab for them and I went in there and uh, they wanted something in solid wood and, uh, and, and darker tones. So we, we came up with the design and I executed that design in a solid mahogany. And the size of the mihrab is 13 feet wide and it's about 18 feet tall, which makes it the largest solid carved mihrab in west of Alhambra mm -hmm. or in, in the Americas. That's very impressive. Alhamdulillah. So how did you get into this kind of work? What sort of skill does it take? We, we bought a home five years ago 
in Houston and we were looking to uh, decorate our house. So me and my wife, we went out and we were looking for these decoration pieces and uh, none of that uh, pieces that were available in the market uh, sit well with us because number one, it did not reflect anything of, of our heritage. Number two, it did not show where we came from or what, the, what kind of stuff we like. Uh, the most of stuff was made in China, made in cheap materials. Uh, so we decided, okay, let's, let's make something for ourselves. So me and my wife, we were researching different material online and we came across this beautiful uh, ceiling from a 13th century palace in Syria. And we decided, we said, wouldn't it be nice to make it? And then that led us to a process of research and uh, finding out how to make it. And then, alhamdulillah, three months later, I came up with this beautiful ceiling, which happens to be the only surviving replica in a private home in the world. Mm -hmm. from Syria. Mm -hmm. You come from a family of artists and you're an architect yourself. How much do those uh, elements help in the work that you're doing? Uh, I think it plays a very big role. Uh, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have that background. Okay. Uh, my, my grandfather, he, he used to build mosques. He was a nakshkar. He would make mehrabs and stuff. Unfortunately, he died when I was only two years old. So I don't know how that get passed over mm -hmm. or not. My father is an architect. So I grew up looking at the plans. I was able to read drawings when I was seven years old. Or, you know. mm -hmm. uh, my sister, she's a graduate from our top uh, art institute in Pakistan, from NCA. Uh, myself being a guy, uh, <laughs> sciences were chosen for me. I was selected to be, I was chosen to be an engineer. Uh, as it goes in so that So you disappointed home. your parents? I disappointed myself okay. uh, because I was, uh, being a guy, you had to make a living and you can't make a living d being an artist. So uh, I became an engineer. Uh, but later on in my life, when I you know, established myself, bought a house, settled down, I had time. And I felt the need to go back to my roots and, and, and satisfy my need to practice art. So this is how I got into it. Mm -hmm. So you're interested in reviving Islamic art in the West. What does that mean? Tell us a little bit about why you're interested in doing that. The Muslim community has been in West, in, uh, and by West I mean Northern America, would be specific to America or Canada. Uh, we've been here for, um, for 40, 50 years. Those are initial generations come in to America or Canada via immigration. And those initial uh, generations who came in 60s and 70s, they, they were mainly middle class and they had very humble resources. And so the mosques that they put together were very humble structures. Uh, just functional structures. Just functional yes. structures. Uh, There's some place to go worship, which was very good. Which, and then you have a second, third generation, a new wave of immigrants, which are more affluent, we're more educated. We have more engineers, doctors, uh, uh, IT people. And, and, and these, uh, these uh, new generation are, uh, are making or contributing to make this beautiful new Islamic uh, mosque, which are purpose-built structures. And, and many times they run into millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the two mosques that I'm, I'm working with, which are uh, in, or in, in tunes of five to six million dollar structures. Now these are very beautiful brand new mosques. Uh, as we're on a uh, as the mosque building is on rise in America, because Islam is the fastest spreading religion in mm -hmm. the world, as we say, so there, of course, there are going to be more mosques. Uh, we need to pay attention to the architectural detail that goes into designing a mosque. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have been doing for the last 30, 40 years in North America has been we just putting uh, drywall and plaster structures and having a place of worship. I think we need, as a community, to move a step up and start producing the kind of st uh, structures and architecture that reflects our heritage and our tradition mm -hmm. um, from past. Do you uh, think there's something about beauty that's important? Um, is that part of spirituality or does that lead an individual to feel more spiritual? As, as you know, uh, there's, a, there's a hadith that says, uh, God is Allah is beautiful yes. and He loves beauty. So uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a responsibility to make to beautify the house of worship. Mm -hmm. Now, when we build our homes, uh, we're spending a million, two dollar, million or two million dollar home, and we spare no expense to beautify our, let's say, kitchen. That's true. You know, yes. you can throw in a kitchen and you can put a, a appliances worth of fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Now, when it comes to mosque, uh, Alhamdulillah, we should go ahead and you know do the same thing. You know, invest in beautifying the structure, and uh, and there are ways to beautify it. Um, the best way is to get the mosque designer or interior designer or architect to get involved earlier in the, pr in the, in the process so that uh, you can design the structure which will accommodate 
these pieces of art and integrate into the architecture. Rahim, much of your work is large scale. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yes. Uh, Islamic art, as we know from centuries ago, uh, is not meant to be hang up on a wall like a single piece is like we do or know these days. If you look at the historic Islamic architecture from the past, the art was incorporated into the architecture of the building. Mm. So if you were to look at the ceiling, you won't see the ceiling. You would see the geometric patterns and the stars, which will make a reference to the constellations and the skies and the heavens. And they will make you wonder or appreciate the beauty of the, of the God's creation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so it wasn't like an accessory that you hang in your living room? No, and it's supposed to be an part, integral part of the architecture. And people build and design these buildings from the ground up, keeping in mind what kind of artwork they're going to house in those structures. Mm -hmm. So if you walk through Alhambra, you'll see this beautiful palace and beautiful courtyards. You know, and everything is, was designed to be there from the beginning. It was not put in there after the thought that, okay, now we have this building and let's put it in there. So all the mehrabs, all the arches, ceilings, uh, even the floors and ornate doors and windows that you see in there was designed and incorporated as a part of the architecture. So my effort or my thing is to bring back that tradition uh, of, and introduce the Islamic art as an integral part of the architecture. So the, the best place to start is to start dressing up the mehrab mm -hmm. because that's a focal point in a mosque. Everybody goes there, worships over there. And if you have a beautiful mehrab, it's much more spiritually elevating when you're praying in that area. Mm -hmm. Now you can go and, you know, uh, like there's the most beautiful mosque that I think is, is a mosque in uh, Abu Dhabi. If, if you're praying in that mosque, your spiritual level is much more highly elevated than you're praying in a small uh, mosque, um, you know, in a, in, in, in a, which has a blank wall. Not that you, you know, you're not connecting with the God, that's a different story, but being in a beautiful place elevates your spirits because Allah himself said, you know, he's beautiful and he likes beauty. So uh, that's why art, you know, in my view, should be made the part of the architecture. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that, you know, one way to beautify the mosque is to, is to improve the mihrab. Um, uh, what about it if a person is starting out to build a mosque? What advice do you have for them? In, uh, because we are expanding community, Mus there, the Muslim population in North America is expanding, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah, very well. We need to create these newer structures. And when you're planning this newer mosque, number one thing we have to keep in mind is allow ample parking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because everybody runs into parking issues. Now once we have solved the parking issue, we need to make sure that we incorporate the traditional art or the art that re represent our heritage. Uh, and if you get the designers involved in the process early on, we can save you money down the line because it's much harder and much more expensive to change something which is already built and then to put in something that should belong there in the first place. Just an example, if, you, if you're making a home and if you want a certain type of kitchen appliances and things, it will make sense for you to go and design it before you put it in. Mm -hmm. uh, after you put it in and then you go and then you're doing the rework, first you're costing yourself a lot of money, hassle, and then uh, it's not going to be the... It's not the perfect fit. Not the right? perfect yeah. fit. So the earlier on you get involved and you, you incorporate these things into your design, the better the outcome, the cheaper the solution, and you can get a much better product. Mm -hmm. Your work is exquisite. It doesn't seem like there, there are many people in North America who are doing this sort of work. Is there a reason for that? Uh, um, Alhamdulillah, it, uh, it, it, it's... Uh, it, I haven't met another person who's doing this okay. work in North America. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I feel that it, it's, uh, I feel more compelled to do better and uh, do uh, much finer of a job because uh, I would like to promote and uh, our tradition and heritage from other from if you're from Egypt, from Morocco, from Andalusia, from India, Pakistan, Persia, Iraq, they all have their own traditions of Islamic art, and we can do we can blend or bring all those traditions because. Muslim community in North America is comprised of all these so communities and we can create these beautiful structures and uh, do a good job. So I feel that uh, I should be doing much better and to bring this work to the people all right. in a public space. All right, that's all the time we have. Thank you, Rahim, for talking to us and uh, hopefully we'll see your work in other mosques in North America in the future. Inshallah. Thank you very much for having me.
That was Rahim Akbar. To find out more about his art, you, art, you can connect with him on Facebook at facebook.com slash woodgallery. That was my interview with Rahim. We'll now pause for a break, but stay with us. We'll come back and talk about how the Quran was revealed and how it differs from the Gospels. <laughs> 